two days talking about momentum. The momentum that exists at a specific moment in time, um, whether it be due to a constant velocity, principle zero, uniform motion, or whether it be momentum after acceleration, which would be principle one, accelerated motion. In the end, we were always looking for, on Monday and Tuesday, momentum at a specific time, whatever that time is. We didn't quantify in any way the change in momentum that can occur over a period of time. That's what we want to do today, is quantify that change in momentum. And we're going to introduce a new concept today called impulse, which is that change in momentum. In fact, that's the definition of impulse, is the change in momentum experienced by an object. Whether we're talking about the gain in momentum as an object speeds up, or the loss of momentum as an object slows down, the change in momentum, the gain or loss of momentum of an object as it speeds up or slows down. Impulse, because it is momentum, like not, not momentum per se, but change in momentum, because it's dependent upon momentum, it is a vector quantity. There is a direction associated with it. It can be positive or negative due to that direction. Now, listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. This can be a bit confusing. It doesn't have to be, but it can be a bit confusing. Impulse can be positive in a couple of different situations. One, if I gain momentum in the positive direction. So let's say the positive direction is right. Okay, look up here. Everybody just drop your pens for a second. I'll we'll give you a chance to write this down in a second, okay? This is to the right. And over towards my desk is to the right. If I gain momentum in that direction, in other words, I'm traveling in that direction and I speed up, Right? I'm speeding up. I'm gaining momentum in the positive direction. That's a positive impulse. Does that make sense? Right? I'm gaining momentum in the positive direction, whatever I define the positive direction as, in this case, to the right. The other time, the other situation that I can have a, a positive impulse is if I, anybody want to take a stab at this? If I gain momentum in the positive direction or I lose momentum in the negative direction. So in other words, I'm moving to the left, but I slow down. Think about that. If I'm moving to the left and I slow down, the force must be to the right. Therefore, the impulse is to the right. Even if I'm moving to the left, my impulse can be to the right if I'm slowing down. So we have a positive impulse if I gain momentum in the positive direction or if I lose momentum in the negative direction. Conversely, I would have a negative impulse if I, if I lose momentum in the positive direction or if I gain momentum in the negative direction. Right? If I slow down moving to the right, that's a negative impulse. If I speed up moving to the left, that's a negative impulse. We're going to say impulse is a vector. It is a positive value when momentum is gained in the positive direction. Um, and is a negative value when momentum is lost in a positive direction. I'm going to add a little note to this, actually. Or momentum lost in negative direction. And it has a negative value when it's lost in the positive or gained in the negative direction. So if I drop a ball from, I don't know, let's say from a meter and a half, where my hand is right now, a meter and a half above the ground, and we're looking at the impulse that the ball experiences as it falls, would you consider that to be a positive impulse or a negative impulse? As the ball falls, is the impulse, the change in momentum. Would you agree that there's a change in momentum of the ball? What's the momentum of the ball now as I hold it? Zero. What is it half a second from now? Something, right? Is that a po So there's an impulse, a change in momentum. Is it a positive or a negative impulse? Who says positive? Who says negative? It would be a negative impulse. How come it's a negative impulse? Yep. Good. It's gaining momentum. It's speeding up 
in the negative direction. That would be a that would be a negative impulse, right? Now, what about when that ball hits the ground? What if we're looking for the impulse that it experiences as it hits the ground? It's moving just before it hits, right? And then after it hits, it stops. That's a loss of momentum, right? As it moves downward. Is that a negative impulse or a positive impulse? Who says negative? Who says positive? Yep, that would be a positive impulse. How come? Because I stopped or I lost momentum in the negative direction. Lost momentum in the negative direction, positive impulse. Does that make sense? All right. What does the equation for impulse look like? Well, I'm going to actually derive it for you. I don't derive a whole lot of equations for you, but this one I will. It comes from Newton's second law. Do you guys remember what Newton's second law is from Physics 20? First law is the law of inertia. Object at rest stays at rest. Object in motion stays in motion in a straight line at a constant speed until acted upon by an unbalanced force. The third law is the action-reaction one. Object A applies a force on B. B applies an equal and opposite force on object A. Remember that? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The second law is basically F is equal to M times A. So we're going, to do, we're going to write that down, Newton's second law, in an equation form, F is equal to M times A. You guys remember this, right? Hope so. Now I'm going to replace A with delta V over delta T. So that's going to make this equation look like this. Is that okay to do? Is that legal what I just did? I didn't sub a number in for acceleration, but I just subbed an expression in for acceleration. That's fine. If I had delta V and delta T, I could have calculated A and then subbed the number in, but whatever. The expression is just as good. Now I'm going to take the T up by multiplying. Just rearrange it just a little bit. And I get this. F times delta T is equal to M times delta V. Right, that's fine, right? It's just rearranging. Now I want to ask you a question. What does M times delta V mean? What's delta mean? Change. Change in something, right? Delta V means change in velocity, right? All right, if M times V is momentum, and it is, because that's what we've spent the last two days talking about, right? M times V is momentum. Then M times change in V would be change in momentum, right? Or in other words, it would be the, the impulse, right? This is the impulse. Delta P, that's a symbol, by the way, that I use for impulse, is delta P. Next year in university, you might see the symbol J, a capital J for impulse. Okay, it makes more sense to me to use delta P because that defines impulse. But notice that impulse isn't just equal to M times delta V. It's also equal to F times T. Let's think about that for a second. What do you need to do to change the momentum of something? What do you need to do to make it speed up or slow down, for that matter? Sorry? Give it energy, yes. By give, to give it energy, though, you need to give it a... Yeah, yes, okay. Give it energy, do work on it, same thing. But to do work on it, you need to apply a... Sorry? You need to apply a force. Not a change in force, just a force. You need to apply a force, right? If you don't push something or pull something, you're not going to change its energy. Or you're not going to do work on it. If you don't push something or pull something, you're not going to change its momentum. Right? So you need to push or pull on something. You need to apply a force. But it's not good enough just to apply a force in an instantaneous force. You need to apply that force for a period of time. The longer the period of time, the more you're going to change the momentum. So we're going to say the change in momentum is, of course, it's m times change in velocity, but it's also equal to the force that you apply times the time that you apply it for. Now, I'd like you to take a look at your data sheet for a second. Bottom left-hand corner, right under p is equal to m times v, you see another equation, f times t is equal to m times delta v. That's your impulse equation. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually say that that's impulse. What I'm going to ask you to do is write down right beside that, Delta P. 
Or you might even want to write the word impulse in there. Impulse, delta P is equal to M times delta V. Now, one of the things that I see people doing semester after semester, year after year, is this. When they write down the equation for impulse, which is this, right? Two-thirds of which is in your data sheet, one-third of which isn't. They like to do this. Delta P is equal to M times V. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with what I just did? Yep. Yes, that's momentum. That's not change in momentum. That's momentum. People like to leave off the delta beside the V. I'm telling you, man, don't do that. Don't leave off the delta. It might seem like a silly little thing. Oh, I leave off the delta. Big deal. If you leave off the delta, then you are likely, when you're calculating this, to only use one velocity instead of two velocities. Whenever you're calculating impulse, you need two velocities, the final and the initial. If you leave off the delta, you're probably only going to use the final or the initial. And you're going to get the question wrong. You're going to solve for the momentum at a certain time, not the impulse. Does that make sense? Right, if we're careful in the way we write the equation, then we're much more likely to put the right numbers in and solve it correctly. Let's take a look at example number one here. Already. So it's a 1,200-kilogram car. is originally traveling 25 meters to the north. 35 seconds later, it's traveling at 10 meters per second to the south. What's the impulse and what's the force required to change the car's velocity from its initial to its final value? You could find the momentum of the car initially. You could find the momentum of the car at the end. That's, that's fine. That's not what you're looking for. You're looking for the impulse, which is the, not the momentum that it was or that it is, but rather it's the change in momentum. Okay, that's what we're looking for here, is the change in momentum. I'm going to pull out the red pen. I'm going to draw attention to this. Okay, why do you think I circled north and south there? Right, my red circle or your purple highlighter or whatever it is that you draw attention to things with. Why do you think I drew attention to that? What silly mistake could I make after not circling north and south there? Yep. Yes. Okay, I, I got to remember that one of them is positive, one of them is negative. North is usually positive and south is usually negative. It doesn't really matter as long as one of them is positive and one of them is negative for sure. Okay, we're asked to solve for impulse so clearly what we just learned, impulse, is what we're going to use here. Let's write down some givens. I got mass of 1,200 kilograms. Uh, what is this? 25 meters per second. That's a velocity, isn't it? Just velocity? Is that delta V? Is that V? Is that VI? Is that VF? What is it? And what do you think that is? Is that VI, VF, delta V, V? Velocity. Just velocity? Yeah, yeah it would be VI, actually, right? The car is initially traveling at 25. Then it's traveling at 10. Does that make sense? At the beginning, it's traveling at 25. We'll call that VI. At the end, it's traveling at... Uh, 10 meters per second, but we're going to make it negative because it's 10 meters per second to the south. And my time interval here is 35 seconds. Looking for the impulse. Um, look, we got three parts to this equation. Uh, impulse is equal to F times delta T is equal to M times delta V. Um, you know that we're only going to have to use two of the three parts, right? Pick whichever two parts work for you based on your givens. Um, clearly, I'm going to use this since I'm looking for impulse. What do you want to do, F times T or M times delta V? Yeah, look at your givens. I don't know, I don't know what F is, right? I got T. That's good. I don't know what F is. So let's go with M times delta V. 
My mass here is 1,200. Delta V is VF minus VI. That's negative 10 minus 25. Oh, man. You can see what might have happened if I just wrote down M times V, right? If I just used M times V, there's a pretty good chance I would have used either the 25 or the negative 10, not both. You calculate that value, it works out to be negative 4.2. 4.20, I should say, times 10 to the 4 newton seconds. Hey, that's a negative impulse. Should it be? What's happening? This car is moving to the north, but then what happens? It slows down in the positive direction, right? Oh, wait a second. By the end of the problem, it's... It's actually stopped and moving in the negative direction. It's slowing down in the positive direction. And then it stops and speeds up in the negative direction to the south. So either way you look at it, that should be a negative impulse, right? And it is. How about the force required to change the car's velocity from its initial to its final value? Look, I just found impulse. Why don't we just say now impulse is equal to F times T. Use the other part of the equation now. Impulse over time. Impulse is, uh, let's use the unrounded number there. Is it exactly 4.2? Yes. Negative 4.2 times 10 to the negative 4. Oh, by the way, do you notice I use Newton seconds there? Did you notice that? I told you on day one that you could, right? But that I'd explain later where that comes from. Do you see where it comes from now? Impulse is equal to force times time. Newtons times seconds, right? Could you still use kilograms meters per second for that? Absolutely. My time interval here is, what, 35.0 seconds? That gives me a force of negative 1.20 times 10 to the 3 newtons. The force is negative. Should it be? Yeah. I'm moving to the north, and I'm slowing down. That requires a force that is acting to the south. And then I stop, and then I turn around, and then I speed up going to the south. If you speed up going to the south, that requires a force to the south. A negative force, Gabe? Okay. The new numerator there, why is your exponent negative? Uh, it shouldn't be. That should be a positive. Thank you. 4.2 times 10 to the 4. It's the same number as we got from the, from the previous one, right? Now, what if I hadn't even been asked question A for the impulse? Could we have still done B? Sure. We could have still, even, though, even if we weren't asked for the impulse in question A, we still could have solved for the impulse in question A and then set it equal to F times delta T. Or we could have just done this. If you're asked to solve for impulse, of course you're going to do impulse. If you see a force and a time in the same question, even if you don't see the word momentum or impulse, you're still going to do impulse. Right? Even if question A wasn't asked, we'd still do impulse here because we got a time and we got a force in the same question. Now, understand, we derived this from Newton's second law, right? F is equal to m times a. You could still do this question using Newton's second law, F is equal to m times a. Nothing wrong with that. But the impulse method becomes so versatile. It becomes so handy and universal. It's just like, oh, this is what we do? Let's do it. Instead of a hundred different variations of different questions. All right? Is still okay with that? Okay, what I'd like you to do right now is take a look at worksheet number two. Specifically on worksheet number two, the first four questions. 
uh, sorry, the first three questions. We're going to do the rest of it, but right now I just want you to look at the first three questions. So we'll get number three, everyone. It says a 1,500 kilogram car accelerates from 55 to 90 kilometers per hour. That's the impulse experienced by this car, looking for this impulse. Um, let's say that uh, the mass is 1,500 kilograms. Something's 55 kilometers per hour. What is that? V what? V what? This is VI. This is the initial velocity, right? VF, the final velocity, is going to be 90.0 kilometers per hour. Now, that 55 kilometers per hour meters per second, we do want to convert this to meters per second, is 15.277. And 90 kilometers per hour works out to be exactly 25.0 meters per second. If we're looking for the impulse, we can say it's F times T, but that's not going to be very helpful to me right now. Rather, we can also say it's equal to M times delta V. That's what we want to do here because we have M and VI and VF. 1,500 kilograms times VF, 25.0, minus VI, 15.27778. Let's calculate that. We end up getting... Uh, 1.46 times 10 to the 4. Now, we're not asked to find force here, but if we were, we could also set this equal to what we just found, equal to F times delta T and solve for force that way. Does that make sense? That's what you're going to have to do in the next three questions, questions 4, 5, and 6. You're not asked to solve for the impulse. Rather, you're asked to solve for uh, question number 4, the force... And number five, also the force. And number six, I guess all three of them, also the force. So get the impulse like you did in questions one, two, and three. And then set the impulse equal to F times delta T. Does that make sense? Okay, let's have a look at four, five, and six then. What we're doing here. Let's take a look at number six here. It says uh, a one kilogram ball is traveling toward a soccer player at a velocity of five meters per second. And it rebounds. What does that mean, rebounds? Yeah. yeah, it goes back in the other direction, right? So it's coming towards the soccer player, and then it hits the soccer player and goes off in the opposite direction, away from the soccer player. It rebounds. Uh, at a velocity of 8.5 meters per second. I'm going to draw attention to that word rebounds. How come? What am I going to have to do with that? Yep. Sure. One of those velocities is going to have to be negative, right? They're opposite directions. 5 meters per second, 8.5 meters per second are opposite directions. One of them is going to have to be negative. It doesn't really matter which is which. Hey, which one do you want to make positive? Coming towards me or going away from me? You choose. Sorry? Going away? Okay. So that means that this is going to be positive and this is going to be negative. Agree? You could have made it the other way around. doesn't make any difference as long as you're consistent. Time of contact is 2.0 times 10 negative 2 seconds. What's the force to the foot applied on the ball here? I'm going to say my mass is 1.00 kilograms. And I'm going to say my initial velocity here is negative 5.00 meters per second. How many people did it that way, by the way? How many people said uh, going away from me is positive? One, two, okay. How many people said coming towards me is positive? Many, most of you. Okay, that's okay. So for you guys, it, you just would have had VI as positive 5, right? And VF, instead of VF being positive 8.50, you would have had VF as negative 8.50. My time of contact here is 2.00 times 10 to the negative 2 seconds. And we're looking for the force here. Now, some of you would have calculated the impulse using m times delta v, got a number for that, and then said, well, impulse is also equal to f times delta t, and therefore f is equal to delta p over delta t. Got a number for that, subbed it into there, and then calculated force. How many of you did that? How many of you calculated impulse and then set it equal to this? Yeah? How many people just did this? How many people said f times delta t is equal to m times delta v. f is equal to m times delta v over delta t. How many people did it all in one step like that? Okay, about half and half. Whatever. Um, 
I usually, to be honest, do it this way. But I'm not suggesting to you that that's necessarily better. It's just the way that I do it. If you do it the other way, that is absolutely fine. Really, it's the same thing, right? My mass here is one kilogram delta V. Be careful here. 8.50 minus negative 5. If you define the signs the opposite way, you would have gotten negative 8.5 minus 5. My delta T is 2.00 times 10 to the negative 2 seconds. Let's calculate that on the calculator here. Just make sure you can do it. I say 1 times bracket 8.5 subtract negative 5. And then I'm going to divide that by 2. Make sure you use that second function EE button for exponents. Okay, that's how you enter it times 10 to the something. 2 times 10 to the negative 2. If we do this, it gives me uh, 675 newtons. And that's my answer. Look what would have happened if I had have defined it the other way around. I would have said 1 times negative 8.5, subtract positive 5, divide it by 2 times 10 to the negative 2. What do you think I should get there? Negative 675, right? Your force should be away from the soccer player. Ryan's, Ryan defined away from the soccer player as positive. Most of you defined away from the soccer player as negative. Ryan should have got a positive answer. Most of you should have got a negative answer. Right? When we press enter here, we, sure enough, we're going to get negative 675. Both of them are correct as long as your sign for your answer is consistent with the rest of the question. Does that make sense? Okay.